Man, the couple of weeks I just had. Oh, oh my God. It's been, it's been a rough month, folks. Not, not gonna lie. Thankfully, I did have my reading goal to keep me in check. The goal, of course, to read a bunch of horror books during the month of October. And because of the unfortunate circumstances I had to deal with in the past few weeks, I had even more time to read than I initially expected, so I finished even more than I expected. So let's go over those, see if any of them are worth it, if there were any new favorites, and if there were any you still may be able to squeeze in before Halloween. So we got seven to talk about today, and I'm gonna be starting by I briefly mentioning one I've already talked about. That was the Silver Eyes. Uh, I made the whole video on this uh, Five Nights at Freddy's book already, so don't have much to say other than, yeah, it was terrible. My thoughts have not changed. Very bad. But there's a little bonus. I guess I could tell you what I thought of a film. It was fine. Yeah, it had some, it had some, like, big issues, but also, like, it was Five Nights at Freddy's. It was kind of exactly what I expected. I thought Matthew Lillard was really good in the movie. I thought the cupcake was awesome. I love the cupcake. You know, it was just a, a fine, serviceable family horror film. I think kids will love it. It's a great, like, entry point into the genre. And yeah, whatever. I'll, I'll be seated for the sequel. <laughs> Next up, we have some book club books. Uh, our book club is very festive. We usually like to get into the holidays, read books relating to whatever's going on. And we managed to squeeze in three horror books this year. The first, of course, and you can't really have October without it, a Stephen King book, Bag of Bones. So this one follows Mike, a writer who is struggling with writer's block after the tragic death of his wife. For a change of scenery, he heads out to their old lake house, where he befriends a young mother and sort of gets swept up into the ongoing custody battle over her child. And also the lake house he is staying in uh, is very haunted. So this one was interesting. King is still, you know, at the top of his game when it comes to character work. Once again, giving us some really great characters uh, who are super well detailed and thought out. And I actually think, like, the legal custody battle side of this book was very interesting, which is kind of weird, because that plot kind of sounds like it would not be. <laughs> but I did really like that aspect of the book. I also like a lot of the lore and mythology he put into this world here. A lot of creepy stuff going on, you know, pretty cool to see. But you see, I also thought this book did have a lot of issues. It's definitely longer than it needed to be. You know, I was never super bored during it, but it does meander quite a bit. Definitely think like a hundred or so pages could have been cut from this. I also think that this is one of the instances where King goes a bit too far with the sex stuff. Thankfully, nothing involving children this time around, but there is a very uncomfortable age gap between two characters. And you know, I think there are just moments and descriptions and you know, thoughts we're seeing inside the character's head that were very unnecessary and uh, did not serve the plot much. So yeah, overall, I thought this was a good book, a decent read. But as far as King's whole bibliography goes, not one I'd really recommend you start with. But if you've already read a ton of them and you're looking for more, I mean, yeah. It'll, it'll do the job, I suppose. Three and a half stars for this one. Now, that book was kind of long, a bit longer than the books we usually read in book club. It took us a full month to get through. So afterwards, we wanted to take a bit of a break, chill for a bit, and we checked out the childhood classic, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. I sort of went above and beyond here, mainly because I was, like, completely out of my mind sick with COVID. But I did the, uh, the entire trilogy, all three books. So if you are unaware about what these books are, they are essentially, like, retellings of, you know, urban legends, folk tales, presented in these, like, bite-sized, very short stories that kids can get a kick out of. And they're also accompanied by the these, like, genuinely unsettling pieces of artwork, which have become very iconic over the years, and I'm sure a lot of people have some childhood trauma relating to them. As for me, I would, like, glance through these books, maybe read a story here or there as a kid, but I never really got super into them. You know, I was more of a Goosebumps guy, I liked longer stories. I still kind of do. But I think that these these books all did a pretty good job of just telling these short, creepy little stories. Some of them you've heard tell of many times before, whether that be like at school, on the playground, or just in general pop culture. They also made a pretty decent movie, which incorporated a lot of these stories into it. Though I was kind of surprised to see that like a lot of these stories are actually meant to be comedic, which I didn't really expect going in, and it was a pleasant surprise to sort of break up all the uh, scares. My favorite of these stories was probably The Viper. The thing though with reading all three of them back to back and you know also being an adult I found a lot of them 
definitely started to get very repetitive. The very first story in this one is the big toe, and they use that exact same formula and plot structure in like a lot of these stories. And I could only take so many shorts where, you know, the twist is that the character was dead the whole time before getting kind of bored of them. <laughs> but thankfully they're so short, none overstay their welcome. And it was a fun way to kill a few hours if you're feeling nostalgic. And of course, definitely one to show kids who are interested in horror. And then the last book for book club, was, uh, was a return to a fan-favorite author here. Siggy Shade, who are they? Who knows? Whoever they are, I hope they're okay. Earlier in the year, we read a book by them called Breeding with Bigfoot, uh, which, uh, you see, Siggy Shade writes, uh, I don't really know if there's a proper term for this, monster smut? Just very, very explicit and graphic romance novels, uh, which usually involve a young woman and a cryptid, and it leads to a lot of uh, fantasy scenarios playing out. I don't want to say like you would expect, because it's way more absurd than you actually expect. So Jack's Head uh, is one of these stories, uh, which involves a young woman who is captured by the ghost of Jack, the Headless Horseman, who comes to Earth every Halloween to kill a bunch of innocents. But after seeing this young woman, uh, he has a complete change of heart and decides that he will let her live uh, if she can, let's say, uh, pr prove herself worthy before dawn. I think the biggest issue with this book was that I had already read Breeding with Bigfoot. Now, now here's the thing. You might think I'm absolutely crazy for saying this, but Breeding with Bigfoot uh, kind of slaps, okay? I didn't really see this book as actual smut. I mean, I'm sure some some weirdos did. But to me, this played out much more like a comedy, like a parody of these types of books. And I just thought the whole way through, it was laugh out loud funny. And so Jack's head has a lot of those elements, but it is much shorter, much more stripped back. There is less of an attempt to tell an actual story, which I thought was one of the funniest highlights of Breeding with Bigfoot. So instead, it's just these very long, absurd sex scenes. And it was just kind of whatever. Like, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't that into it. Also, and I know this came out a little bit before Bigfoot, but I noticed a shocking amount of similarities between these books. That makes me wonder, like, is each of these books just a ripoff of the last? I mean, that's not really surprising, but I would have liked to see a bit more variety here. Jeez. Anyway, yeah, this gets a two stars out of me. Um, Breeding with Bigfoot is much better. Would highly recommend that one. <laughs> if you're up for it, there's a long list of trigger warnings at the start of these books, and they do not lie or exaggerate at all. Uh, be wary. I did sign, like, an email thing, uh, for a Breeding with Bigfoot sequel, so hopefully that comes out someday. Uh, yeah, still look forward to that. But until then, Siggy Shade, keep, keep at it, I guess. Keep, keep making that bread. And now a few books that I got through on my own. First up, one that needs no introduction, Coraline by Neil Gaiman. This is a very famous horror novella, follows a little girl who, you know, finds this other world in her house. That seems like this perfect paradise, but of course there is a dark twist. It's full of whimsy and imagination and childlike wonder and unspeakable horrors. Yes, yeah, so when it comes to this one, I grew up with the uh, stop motion movie, which still holds up to this day and is genuinely fantastic. Not just as a horror story for all ages, which, you know, you don't see very often, but as a great entry point for kids to get into horror. I know I said that about Five Nights at Freddy's, but ignore that. Coraline is leagues above it. <laughs> now, because the movie was a very faithful adaptation of the book, nothing about this book really surprised me. It played out exactly how I remembered it from the movie. Unfortunately, of course, lacking my autistic King Wyborn. But yeah, it's great. It's just a Ton of fun, ton of imagination. This is actually my first Neil Gaiman book. I have a few more on my shelf I need to read, but I found his writing to be absolutely delightful, and I'm very interested in reading more of his stuff and some of his more, you know, adult-oriented stories. So this one is a solid four stars for me. This next one is the most uh, recent book I finished, I actually just, just finished it before I started this video. And that is The Last House on Needless Street by Catrion Award. Uh, who is an author. I've been seeing her books all over the place lately. She's got a bunch of them out. And this was one that was uh, recommended to me on the video a while back. I thought it sounded uh, very interesting, very, very mysterious. And I got through it. And boy, boy, did I. It's very hard to say what this book is about. Uh, it's one you should very much go into completely blind. I did, and I was all the better for it. So all I will really say is that it follows a man named Ted who lives on a house on Needless Street. And after a new neighbor moves into a house across from his, he starts to worry that secrets he has may get exposed. So this book was excellent. 
I was absolutely caught off guard pretty much at every corner. Its narrators are very unreliable. You can never really tell exactly what's going on, not in a way where things don't make sense, but in a way where things just feel off. You think you have this picture of what is happening, where the story is headed, but the book is constantly keeping you on your toes and switching things up on you. It was suspenseful, it was thrilling, and it really messes with your head more than most books I have read. I am still reeling from some of the reveals in this book. It's crazy too, cause like, once you realize what the book is doing, what its whole shtick is, you're trying to piece together scenarios in your head of where you think it is going to go, and as the book is going on, you're like, oh yeah, okay, my theory might be right. All of these pieces are coming together the way I envisioned them. Just stop, just stop what you're doing. You're, you're not, you're not right. <laughs> so yeah, um, absolutely cannot recommend this book enough. This is definitely an author I'm going to be reading more of, and I really, really hope that some of you will check it out as well. So that'll be a four and a half stars. Uh, definitely, definitely a highlight of my October, but I did save the best for last. So Dark Harvest takes place in a small American town uh, where every Halloween, a scarecrow rises from the cornfield and terrorizes this town. So in sort of a competition ritual type thing, the town gathers all of its teenage boys together to go hunt the monster and kill it. These boys are motivated to kill Pumpkin Man by, you know, a, a ve very tasty cash prize. And the main boy we follow uh, has a family who has been going through some tough times, could really use that money, so he is very determined to kill Sawtooth Jack. This was Halloween. This is the vibe I'm looking for. This was so good. You might be thinking this sounds kind of like stuff you've heard before. And sure, this is one that definitely wears its inspirations on its sleeve. But where this book excels so much is in the way that things don't really play out how you would expect. There are a lot of huge shifts in this book in which you sort of rethink everything that you had been reading up to this point that made for an experience that was extremely engaging, super fast paced, and always had me on on my toes the way a good horror book should. And it all came together in an extremely satisfying ending, which had me pump in my fist. I read this book because I liked the premise. I wasn't really expecting anything special, but everything about this one was very special. And I think if there was one book you could squeeze in uh, before Halloween, this is definitely the one you should take a look at. It's pretty short, but it does get a five stars out of me, and it's easily one of my favorite reads of the year. Now, the reason I actually heard about this book was because they turned it into a movie, which just came out the other week. And this movie was very frustrating, because, like, it did capture the vibes, and, you know, I was enjoying it a lot. It was the Dark Harvest I knew, with, you know, a few changes, which I didn't mind. It was extremely gory, which I thought was pretty fun. But they changed the ending, man. They changed The ending was so good, and they didn't really have a reason to change it. And the one we got was just so unsatisfying. I, it really, really bugs me. So, yeah, I can really only recommend that movie if you're a big fan of the book and just want to see how they do it. Definitely don't have that movie be your only experience with this story. So yeah, that'll do it. Thank you all for watching. I've I've really been through the ringer this month, but a lot of these books, well, not all of them are home runs. Uh, you know, most of them helped me get through it. Took out some ones I've always wanted to read, discovered some new favorites. And now it's your guys' turn to let me know in the comments what you've been reading this month. And if there's anything I should be checking out since I liked all of these ones. So yeah, have a safe and happy Halloween, folks. I think I'll be watching Halloween Ends again, so that's always a fun time. Love, love my boy. And I'll see you all in November, because I haven't only been reading horror books. It'll be Oathbringer time. <laughs>